Estoy muy emocionado uh, de estar aquí, demasiado. I am the 2017 World Barista Champion, so I know how to make coffee. It's my skill. It's not as important as a lot of the work that you guys do. I've come here to share my insight of the market that I work within. So I've spent 15 years, 17 years, too much time working in the UK and in Europe and understanding the specialty cafe market there. Understanding the problems of roasters, the problems of cafes, trying to solve some. I spent most of that time working for a brand called Has Been that has built amazing relationships in El Salvador. Maybe 12 years with Steve Layton, who I think is one of the best coffee buyers in the world who really understands quality. And he introduced me to the flavors and the culture of this place. And I love Salvadoran coffee, me and Canton. For me, it's the perfect espresso. Ah, I should use this. <laughs> me and Canton. Uh, for me, Salvadoran coffee is the perfect espresso. It has this wonderful texture, traditional bourbon type varieties, wash process, great body, great sweetness, and fruit and acidity that lifts the cup. It's something that you should all be very proud of. It is classic and progressive all at once, just like customers look for. I remember the first time I tasted coffee from Finca Kilimanjaro, and it changed my world. I remember my first cup of Lafani and other, cafe, uh, other coffees from Sea Cafe. I remember the first time I tasted the Pacas variety, and more recently, Elefante and Bernardina, all of which have enriched my life. In 2010, when I first joined Has Been, the gift that Steve gave me in my interview was uh, 250 grams of coffee from a Cup of Excellence winning farm, Finca Alaska. It was a washed bourbon, but it had dried on the tree and had the flavors of a natural coffee. And it was so expressive and interesting, I knew that was where I wanted to spend my life. And on my first day, we approved a 20-bag lot from a producer we'd never met. It just tasted so good on the cupping table. And over the last 12, 15 years, it's become one of our most important direct relationships. We now buy 200 bags each year from Finca Argentina in our Japan. And Alejandro Martinez, that farmer, is one of my closest friends. In 2015, I used coffee from Finca Siberia, one of the Sea Cafe farms, in the Brewer's Cup and placed highly in the UK. It was the most incredible natural I'd ever tasted. And in 2017, when I won my UK national competition and had the chance to go to the Worlds, Steve prepared for me a table of coffees for me to choose from, all exceptional coffees, amazing Panamanian geishas, great coffees from Costa Rica, beautiful natural Kenyans. But one coffee stood out for me as the right coffee for me, the one that sang with flavors that I wanted to talk about. And as I brewed it as espresso, I knew in my heart that was the coffee I wanted to share. And it was from that same producer, that first coffee that I had from the business. So from Ernesto Mendez in Santa Ana, from his farm Las Brumas. It was an incredible coffee, and it changed my life. It gave me so many amazing opportunities. So hopefully, after saying all of this, you can trust my love for your coffee and your country, and if we trust each other, you can listen if I say a few difficult things, some hard things. So, you know your history. El Salvador, as a nation, was built on coffee. It's so integral to the country it's become. It set the model for what it was to produce coffee in quantity, and, you know, in the 70s, was the fourth largest producer in the world for this tiny country. It's an amazing feat. But as with many things in the world, someone sets the model, the template, and others with more resource, more land, more money can copy that model and replicate it faster, do something different, and steal the value. And I think this happened with El Salvador for lots of complicated reasons. So the model of quantity is gone. It's the past. When I first started in coffee, 
El Salvador was the poster child of specialty coffee. It represented ideas of expertise, of tradition, of new generations joining the fight to build something fresh and new, opportunity, and excellence. For me, it literally was the poster child, seeing Aida and understanding what being a producer might mean within an economy, what a focus on quality might mean. And I fell in love with this idea. I love specialty coffee, not just the flavors. I love the flavors, they dragged me in, but what kept me in specialty coffee was the community that we build, shared beliefs that we have purpose and a mission to do something better that there is a rising tide that will lift all boats, that the value that is created by focusing on excellence will find a market that is willing to pay more for something better, and that value will encourage everyone to produce better coffee and to succeed at a higher level, and everyone will win. But if the goal is for everyone to win, I think we can say it's not working out. We can say that specialty has failed. It has succeeded for a few producers in every country, and that's a good thing. It's something I'm really proud of with direct trade, building relationships, and helping the success of some individuals who really care. But it hasn't changed the story. We're still talking about the same problems in coffee that we were not just when I started 15, 20 years ago, but 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So we have to find other solutions to work in tandem. We have to do more. This proves to me that it hasn't worked because if coffee was working properly, the numbers would be going up. People would be encouraged, would be jealous of the success and co copying different models and replicating it and everyone would be growing and having a richer, better life. And I know that this story is more complicated than this. I know that challenges like leaf rust really affected production and then later exports, but leaf rust is a symptom of a bigger problem that has not gone away. It's climate change and it will come back with different symptoms over and over again. And one of the things that I find really challenging and uh, upsetting is that some of the things, the plant stock that created El Salvador's quality will probably not survive the conditions that are coming. So change has to happen. Specialty coffee as an idea makes some producers' lives better, but it is generally the ones with the most resource, the most knowledge, but more importantly, the ones with the best market access. And really, this talk is about market access for everyone. When we look at Salvador's current exports, some of it looks really good, really exciting, but depending on your perspective, you can question it. So around 50% of exports go to the US, and it makes sense because they're a close neighbor, you have a strong Salvadoran community in the US, so there are real personal relationships and storytelling, but the US only buys 20% of coffee in the world. So these statistics suggest that there is a gap that can be filled by Salvadoran coffee. There are other partners out there, potentially more partners that will spend more money and create new markets and new opportunities. Now, the U.S. is a different market compared to most of the others around the world. The U.S. is used to drinking filter coffee, where Salvadoran coffee shines. But it's the customer expectation that is what coffee means. Fresh, ground to order, and brewed. But in almost every other large market, it's espresso. Espresso is the drink that sells, it's what drives the volume that roasters buy, and is the most important drink for success. But there's also a problem that I'm seeing trends in all these other markets, and I believe at some point those trends will also happen in the US. So thinking about the UK and Europe is also important for your success in the US. Okay, so talking about the UK and Europe and their specialty market, over the last 15 years, I have seen an explosion in specialty coffee. 
Instant coffee consumption has been replaced by cappuccinos. Cafes pop up everywhere. There are more beautiful, amazing cafes in London than ever before. And we see the same thing in Madrid, in Porto, in Berlin. You cannot move for finding exceptional espresso from amazing espresso machines. The cafes are beautiful. The baristas are passionate and skilled. But not all the stories of specialty coffee are spreading all the way through. This is a beautiful cafe in London, and it's really representative of what drinks sell and what works. And the espresso machine dominates. The third wave is growing, but it's all about tattoo baristas pulling shots and pouring latte out. And when I say that specialty coffee is growing, and we see this explosion of people buying better things, it's not quite true. Some ideas of specialty coffee are growing, the most tangible. It's maybe easier to say that third wave or fourth wave cafes are growing with a focus on two things. So artisanality or craft, the craft of how the coffee was prepared at the farm and processed, but the craft of the barista and the roaster also. So this idea of something well made that resonates really well. Another story is an ethical story, that if you're buying specialty coffee rather than from a chain but from a small independent, you're doing something good, they're spending more money on coffee, every other problem will be fixed by this. So no one has to think too hard. That's what specialty means to many cafes and many cafe consumers. But the challenge with all of this is that market dynamics change that story. So every cafe is struggling to stand out they are struggling to not just sell more coffee, but to make more money from the coffee they sell, to pay the rent in these expensive locations, to pay the wages of baristas. These are natural things, they're not bad things, but it creates a real challenge for coffee because as all these cafes volume grows and they sell more espresso, they're not selling more Cup of Excellence winning filter coffee. They're selling more of their lowest quality version of specialty. An 80-point Brazil that makes up 75% of their blend, and an 81-point Colombian that makes up 20%, and maybe there's 5 10% left over for something else from Ethiopia or Guatemala or even Salvador. The busier the cafes get, the more cafes they open, the more espresso they sell, and all of that value created from this story of specialty coffee is going to gigantic estates in Brazil, and even they are making as much money as they should. They can just keep the cost really low. And all the rest of the value that's created goes to paper cups, marketing, and landlords. So we need to fix this inequality of the growth and success that comes from the specialty coffee story and really put it, more of it in the hands of the people creating that value at the farms with amazing flavors. Now I've got way too many opinions here. Again, I'm a barista. I don't have the answers, but I want to be part of the solution. I don't believe quantity is the answer for El Salvador. And much of this story is about El Salvador. I know we have producers from lots of other countries here. A lot of the problems that drive my thinking are common to all the countries in Central America. It's different for Brazil. It's a little different for Colombia. It's certainly very different for Vietnam. Those countries can produce volume, they have more land, more resource, and they can produce volume cheaply. It is a race to the bottom that even if you could win, you shouldn't. No one should win that game. And my belief is that in five years or ten years, China will win it. In the same way they've won it with technology and manufacturing. Now I'm going to say an even harder thing. Quality is not the answer. It's not quite true. Quality is super important. But El Salvador has amazing quality coffee. Amazing coffee that compete with the very best in the world. I don't believe that improving your coffee from 84 points to 85 points will make a significant difference to the amount of return you get for your investment. You need to make the highest quality you can, but the problem is market access. It is bringing buyers together with producers and cutting out some of the noise and it is bringing buyers and helping them understand the real value of the work you do, which is more than just making coffee. 
to really find a strategy for El Salvador to succeed beyond its current situation, we have to think like a business. We have to think about USPs. And if I go around this show and say to people, what does coffee from El Salvador mean? What is it that makes it super special and stand out? It will be the same as every other country I visit. They'll say the same things. Our beautiful soil, our amazing altitude, our beautiful, hardworking, compassionate people. These are not unique. I'm sorry. I find this in every Latin American country because all those things are always true. It's beautiful. But what is unique is Salvador's small size. You can look at this as a weakness if you compare yourself to Brazil or Colombia, but I believe because I've grown up in small businesses and being the disruptor, a different person who tries something different, I believe your small size is a huge opportunity. And I think you have to bend into it as an opportunity. You have to think about it as if you were a tech company, not a, not, not a farm, not a commodity. And I know that the government is helping with lots of things. I know there are lots of initiatives, but I want them to not double down, but go 10 times as hard on telling a different story about Salvador and coffee. And they'll only do this if you guys ask for that, if you force the change and say, this is what we need to succeed. So when I think about your USPs, I think about the small size, which means there is an opportunity for everyone to be in a room, to have the conversation, and find a single goal together to pursue and say consistently every time somebody says, what does Cafe de El Salvador mean? Always say the same thing. I think you have other huge benefits. The uh, environmental situation of Salvador and coffee farms is second to none. It's a real benefit. Shade-grown coffee, huge biodiversity corridors, lots of organic or very close to organic production in a very natural way, and lots of interest in agroforestry and ecology. And I think you have another asset that is super underutilized, which you have a whole generation of young people that are looking for direction and purpose. If we could make an exciting opportunity in coffee for them, you would have such power. But that only works if it makes money, if it's a real opportunity to create a better life and a business and a future. And you have a history of deliciousness and espresso quality. So I believe we need to set a huge goal, something almost unachievable, like, uh, like a moonshot project. And I love this speech because when JFK said we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. You have to choose a goal for coffee from El Salvador that is almost impossible, but is worth fighting for and see how close you can get. And again, I'm a white guy who knows how to make coffee. So I have no expertise here, but I have my market insight. So these are the goals I would choose that I would submit. Maybe you have a better one. I would say that maybe you set a goal that the lowest price that anyone can buy coffee in El Salvador is the C price plus one dollar. It's not enough. But there are a lot of people that are selling coffee at a lower level, and it's unsustainable. And if we can lift the bottom, everyone can benefit. All the prices can go up. If we lift the top, it just stretches it out. It increases inequality. But even this, I think, is a bit tame. Instead, I want to think about dollars per hectare, or more than per quintal how much money you make from the work of producing coffee, not just how much money you make from selling your coffee. Because you create so much more value through farming, through local communities, through other products that you can grow on the farm, other revenue streams is a much more sustainable way, and it frees you from the monster of the sea market that only works for consumers. It only ever was designed to work for consumers, so free yourself from it. My opinion is a strategy for El Salvador to fix this is three things, particularly when reaching the UK and Europe. One is sell espresso. That is the story you need to tell. People know the filter coffee is good. They will score it on cupping tables and they'll buy it if that's what they need. But the volumes are tiny across most of the world. It is 5% of what every cafe bar is selling. 
And it, it is unloyal custom. They want to buy the next fanciest triple anaerobic 72-hour whoosh whoosh from whichever region is most fashionable right now. But espresso sells. And El Salvador has coffee that makes the perfect single origin espresso or the perfect core component in a blend that is for a higher level than the cheap Brazil. My second strategy is influencers. El Salvador needs to bring baristas to El Salvador and make it the first country that they visit when they're learning about coffee. Work with the government, work with tourism agencies, work with Avianca, who cares? Bring baristas and let their first experience of coffee farming be with Salvadorans. Let them shake hands, let them look you in the eye, and then let them taste your amazing coffee. And they will go back and they will force their managers, their trainers, and their roasters to buy more Salvadoran coffee. Because nothing beats meeting someone in person. And it is why this event is so powerful, because the right people are in the room to create business. And thirdly, and for me most importantly, I would bet the whole farm on this, put a price on the environmental services and the work you're doing. There are markets for this, the carbon markets that are now open and available through the use of people like Rabobank and Acorn. My company, Ozone has been, is B Corp certified, and we spend a fortune on this marketing material. We spend a fortune on different projects to grow trees in Peru, in Papua New Guinea, in a forest in Scotland. And this is money that's created from coffee. Money that is value that you guys have created in your production that is being leaked out of the system because the projects are easier. It's again market access, we can find a way to do it. So find partners and talk to partners like Eco and Rainbow Bank. Read the science and make it part of what you do. This doesn't need to be formal, but it needs to be priced because every time you grow a tree, you are making a difference and it should be paid for. So if we look at that C plus one dollar, I believe the government should support that, should set a minimum, and then should take a tax on some of that to reinvest in coffee, in the plants you need, in the agri-science, in the research that will make a difference. I don't know how I can help you, but I and baristas like me provide an opportunity for market access, so tell me what I can do to help, and I am yours. And so are many of the people I work with. I hope this is helpful, I hope it's interesting and inspiring, and I am yours all the way through the day, or for some questions now, if I can help more. Gracias. Do we have time for questions, or we need to go? Okay, so I think I can take one or two questions, so if there are any, please go. Or if it was all self-explanatory, that's also good. Question there. Muchas gracias por eh, estar en El Salvador y por darnos una bonita charla. Muchas. Eh, una pregunta puntual. ¿Qué harías tú eh, si fueras a un mercado como, como Europa, Portugal? Llevar tu café por primera vez. Eh, por primera vez. ¿Qué harías? So, if you come to a trade show, if you come to World of Coffee, many producers will come with bags of green coffee to sell to the coffee buyers that are there. And I understand it, but because I've been that white guy in a room, and I come back with a bag of a hundred samples, most of them don't have contact details on, I can't remember who I met, Maybe I only taste three of them, and I don't buy any because we haven't built a relationship. Instead, I think, talk to espresso machine companies, talk to the, the trade show. Find an opportunity to have a barista that will roast your coffee and will brew it as espresso and let them be your ambassador. Stand next to it because then it's super easy for the barista to taste your very best quality coffee, fully prepared, and they're like, what's this? Because it's only when you taste that it matters.
¿Algo más? No more questions. Okay. Oh, there's one. Hola. Hola. Eh, quería consultar para preparar un, un buen expreso. Eh, ¿qué, me, ¿Qué proceso de café, si como una mezcla entre lavado natural o solo natural? Y un poco sobre el tostado para servir un buen expreso. Fácil, <laughs> so easy. <laughs> Uh, okay, if your goal is to have the volume in a store, you have different goals for espresso than if your goal is to impress someone at a trade show in one moment. For amazing, you know, great espresso from one farm, you know, a variety like Boban, Pacamara, really balanced, and a blend of washed and natural that provides body and sweetness with clean flavors and a little acidity. It's good. For, for roasting a coffee like that, most of, the, most of the market that are buying better coffee and willing to spend more money will prefer a similar roast, just a touch darker than you would do for cupping. It's a Filter roast-ish, not a traditional espresso roast. Because the roasters, once they've tasted that way, they can go further if they choose, it's their style, but it's easier for them to experience the flavor. But if you're trying to change someone's mind or make them reconsider Café del Salvador, uh, an exotic variety, an exotic process is very interesting for the first time. It's a, it's a great way of building a relationship, of succeeding at an auction competition, because it will stand out. But you should produce 1% of this. It's for show, it's for marketing. It brings them the first time to the farm to see what's going on. And your goal should be, but I also have the 100 bags you need that will raise your espresso blend from here to here. And the willingness to build a relationship where we work together and build a specific coffee for that roaster. Because the one amazing thing about direct trade and specialty coffee is it's about long-term relationships where we work together and each year we learn more about each other's needs and we win together. It's the only way. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dale, for the presentation.